I know, you're so attractive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, then I've got to do something. Okay. Hold on, keep it going. Now, do we have, know how to have fun in college? Yes, we do. So beautiful. <coughs> Blue, you're beautiful. Oh my gosh, you're loud. Oh my gosh, you're loud. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, so I'm doing my presentation today over marine mammals and how they thermoregulate their bodies. So whales, dolphins, seals, and other marine mammals, uh, they can generate their own body heat just like us, so they're known as endotherms or warm-blooded like we've discussed. But they can survive temperatures as low as negative 40 degrees Celsius. So the interesting thing is they actually have a similar core body temperature as us, is around like 37 degrees. So the question becomes, how can they regulate their body by living in such cold temperatures as that? And then Krista, doesn't matter if there's a lot of Krista's. Uh, I want to inter remember, we're partners. Minus 40 C equals what degrees F? Hmm? Yeah, negative 40 equals negative 40. Isn't that crazy? Minus 40 degrees C equals minus 40 degrees F. Uh, because for the exam, I'm gonna Monday. I'm gonna give you some temperatures to remember the equivalents, right? And so I had to stop there because minus 40 C equals minus 40 F. So there's like two major ways that they can regulate their body. It's behavioral and physiological. The behavioral, like an example, would be like pregnant whales, like going to warmer waters in order to like give birth. Um, and then as far as physio physiological, has to deal with hair, uh, blubber, and then the vascular system. Um, so an example with uh, the hair is that otters have like 130,000 um, hairs per square inch. So that allows them to have like trap a layer of skin or layer of air above their skin in the water and that air helps insul insulate them. Um, so, and then also with the blubber, it's like a layer of tissue containing fat, collagen, and elastin. Um, insulates the organs and like separates them from the environment. Um, another fact is like newborn porpoises, when they're born, they're 43% of their total body is made out of blubber. So. Okay, and then someplace on the side, she mentioned, and put this down because Monday we'll be talking about this, at, uh, behavioral changes and physiological changes. There are two different things that you can help regulate your body temperature. That's perfect. Because you like you can move. If an animal can move, that's one way they regulate their body temperature. And then we've talked about like the counter current heat exchange, right? That's another way to maintain body temperature. We'll do more of that on Monday. Okay, number two. <laughs> Um, you, oh, you're not almost done? almost done. Okay, yeah. almost done. Sorry. <laughs> the other main like with the picture is uh, countercurrent exchange, like we talked about like last week. So, like with the blubber, it's it's not in the extremity, so it allows like um, when it comes back, it's cold and it gets warmed by the warm air um, leaving here. So that's an exa another example of how they can regulate their temperature. Yeah, excellent. Okay, okay. thank you. Number three, go to the door. Okay, thank you. Oh, and just do the arrow one more. Nope, the other way. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, see where it's. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do my presentation on the fennec fox. Um, it's a fox that lives in the Sahara Desert and other sort of desert like areas in North Africa. Um, now, obviously, deserts are really hot. So a fennec fox has to um, be able to adapt to those that extreme heat when it lives in the desert. Um, one of the ways it does this is by creating little burrows, as you can see in the background right here. Um, obviously it's protected it from the sun and it's nice and dark and cool for the fox during the day. Um, they also are nocturnal, um, so they can, they're able to um, do all their hunting and other activities at night when it's a lot colder and not really hot. Um, sorry. Um, 
thing that I found really interesting about them are their ears are really big. And because of all the blood vessels that are in their ears, they're able to help the heat dissipate from their body by vasodilation. Like we talked about before, they um, let all the blood go to the surface of their skin so it dissipates out of their body so they don't get overheated. Um, and they also have their fur, which also helps to reflect heat. Um, but what I also thought found interesting about their fur is that while deserts get really hot during the day, they also get really, really cold at night. Um, so when they're doing stuff at night, their fur also insulates them as well. So they can are able to withstand both the hot temperatures of the day and the cold temperatures of the night when they're in the desert. And that's it. Okay. Questions, comments? Yeah, she mentioned like increased surface area. That's very, it's a very important factor for most heat exchange mechanisms. How much surface area is interacting with the environment? Okay, we're ready for number three and number four can go to the door, right? Yeah, excellent. Can you figure out, yeah. That's yours, right? A little yes. large, a little bit. Can you figure out the pointer there? <laughs> Okay, I'll get out of your way. Here we go. So my example was about wood frogs. And so with amphibians, they especially rely on things like radiation, uh, conduction, and convection because they're ectotherms. But they also have extra adaptations on top of things like that to deal with extreme temperatures. So uh, in extreme cold temperatures, wood frogs will do something called cryoprotection. So normally what happens if you put an animal in freezing temperatures, um, they'll get extracellular ice formation um, between all the cells, and then when that ice starts to form, it'll cause quick osmosis, and the water will leave the cells and form even bigger ice blocks, um, and then the cells shrink, and that eventually is what will kill the animal in extreme temperatures like that. So with wood frogs, they produce high amounts of something called cryoprotectants. So what they use specifically is glucose. Um, and when you increase glucose, that will increase uh, the level, or increased levels of glucose help the frog's cells survive. So if you increase glucose, it will lower the freezing point of the tissues inside of the frog and reduce the amount of ice formation. And if the glucose will also get distributed inside of cells so that when water does leave, um, the cells aren't actually shrinking, there's still something in there keeping the cells <coughs> from shrinking. And so if you ever go to an environment like this where it is freezing cold, um, you if you see a frog and it looks like an icicle, essentially it's more than likely not dead. It just means that that frog shuts, they're not completely shuts down, but mostly shuts down all of its metabolic processes, its heartbeat, its brain function, and puts all of the energy it has left into producing glucose to keep that frog alive when it's that cold. You can also use urea, or frogs can also use urea, and it does the same thing. That's also a cryoprotectant. Um, so they can actually, bring, it's been documented that they have brought their body temperature to between zero and three degrees Fahrenheit, and they can freeze two thirds of their body water and still survive for three or four weeks at a time. That's amazing. If I remember right in high school, I thought the biology teacher kept the frogs in the refrigerator, right? Did they do, Did they ever do that for you guys? Maybe not. Did you guys ever work with live frogs in high school? Wow, we did. Okay, any questions, comments? Now, there might be a little overlap. I think one other person has cryoprotectants, but uh, that's not a problem. Uh, what's the prefix cryo mean? Cold. I think it means cold, doesn't it? Okay, here we are. Are you number five? Or you're four? Come on up here. And then let me, I want to uh, shut my recorder off for one second. Okay, take it away, number four. So I'm going to be talking about um, how adding buffers to dairy cattle diets in the summers help counteract heat stress. Um, so these are some, oh, these are seven um, different consequences of heat stress. So by adding the green on top, there. Oh, by adding um, this, these buffers to the diet, they help kind of counteract some of these issues. So normally the saliva in dairy cattle produces enough bicarbonate um, that they have natural buffers in the rumen. Um, but when extreme temperatures happen and when it heats up, um, the saliva production decreases, um, therefore causing the 
buffers to be less effective. Um, and also, an increased risk for ruminal acidosis occurs when the heat is implemented. Um, so in order to counteract this, um, producers are encouraged to include a summer buffer, as most of them call it, um, to the animal's rations, which will increase potassium, sodium, and magnesium, um, which in turn results in less heat stress by allowing the animals to dissipate heat at a much faster rate. So by adding that, it helps with a lot of these things because most of the consequences, bicarbonate is a um, issue, and so by adding that, it causes the saliva to make more bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, one thing about the rumen. It wants to go acidic. <clears throat> with all the bacteria in the rumen, it, want, it makes a lot of acid, so the cow normally has the bicarbonate in its saliva, and that helps uh, buffer the rumen. Now, where did you get this uh, slide? Google, okay, because it's very good. I mean, it's very good. And remember, the walk, the milking dairy cow is a walking furnace. Anything above 70 degrees Fahrenheit for a hot producer, they start getting heat stress. But here's the beautiful thing. If she's a walking furnace, then she doesn't really get cold ever. And on Monday, we'll talk about the thermal neutral zone. And what there's a thing called the... Uh, the lower uh, critical temperature for the dairy cow is minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Think of it, they don't get cold until minus 40. And that's with still conditions. And then this okay, is just good. an example of, actually I think this one is used in chickens, but it's just a the same idea. Of, yep, same idea of adding it to the ration to help with heat stress. Mm -hmm. And what number were you? Okay, we're ready for five. Oh, that's right. Five is gone, I think, right? She's not here, Brianna. So we're ready to go to six. <coughs> six. And where's number seven? Are you close? Oh, yeah. Then you stay. Yeah, you're close. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And let's see if I can find yours. This is yours? This is a great topic. I saw it. I saw this and I thought, man, oh man, let me show you how to do this. Uh, see that green right there? If you want to point to something. Try not to do it on the floor because Grace is laser pointer crazy. Okay. Well, as summer approaches, um, temperatures will increase here. And so this is in worse conditions, meaning there's no, there's direct sun, no wind, low humidity, and high radiant energy. So if the air temperature is around here, which you would see on your iPhone if you would like go to the weather app, but then that uh, asphalt, since it's black, it, it absorbs the heat and light, so it would turn into 125, 135, 143. And then for example, to like exaggerate the temperatures, you can fry an egg in five minutes at 131 degrees, which is around 83 degrees in the summer. So, um, the alternative to taking your dog out would be to um, walk them in the grass since it's cooler. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and the, I have I, Monday. I've got to bring my infrared thermometer, so I could. I'll try that sometime, maybe between now and Monday. I can aim it at asphalt and instantaneously get the temperature. Okay, because it's infrared. So this is very important because now this would be full sun, right? Because yes. that's. Remember, asphalt's black. That's the best color to absorb the most radiant uh, heat. And so be aware of that, yeah. Even those uh, metal plates that you see on sidewalks, too, get really hot. Okay, we're set. Thank you. Okay, are we to number seven now, right? Three, seven? Okay, great. Okay, good. Because this is yours, right? Yes. And see, I saw you had the same, yeah. You yeah, we had the same. That's one. okay, because a little, you didn't have the same uh, visual, so that's okay. Okay. Okay, so just like some warm blooded animals, cold blooded animals can uh, sometimes hibernate too. Uh, for example, turtles may bury themselves during the winter and be below the freezing point and remain there for up to six months. Frogs may also burrow or they may also freeze solid, like the wood frog. Um, during this hibernation, the fluid around this individual cells freezes, but the cell remains liquid. Uh, this causes osmosis to draw water out of the cell, causing the solute concentration to increase inside the cell. When water fills the cell, glucose rushes in and causes the concentration of the solute 
to increase significantly throughout the cell. Um, for the wood frog in this case, glu uh, glucose acts as a natural antifreeze, um, and this allows the frog to hibernate during at below freezing temperatures. Um, if the water in the cell were to freeze, though, the cell would rupture. So this is why um, this mechanism occurs to let the water inside the cell remain a liquid. So in this example, um, antifreeze proteins are found in the extracellular fluid, and these bind to ice crystals, preventing them from becoming larger and possibly damaging the cell. Uh, as ice crystals form in the extracellular space, uh, water from inside the cell rushes out through the aquaporins, which are just put inside the cellular membrane, uh, to dilute the higher concentrations of the solute. Cryoprotectants uh, enter through aquaporins, and cryoprotectants are just substances that uh, prevent freezing of tissues and prevent cellular damage during freezing. Uh, in this case, it's shown as cryoprotectants being glycerol and urea, which increase the concentration of solutes inside the cell to prevent the harmful outflux of water. Uh, and in the, uh, in the example it was a wood frog and inside the wood frog when it freezes it, it appears to freeze completely solid um, and appears to be completely lifeless but it's still alive uh, and that's what allows it to do that is the water inside the cell not freezing over and this reminds me uh, you know when they freeze bull semen they use glycerol because uh, the worst thing you can happen when you freeze semen is if you get ice crystal formations, it acts just like a knife and cuts the sperm head, and then obviously that's bad. And so another thing about uh, cryoprotectants, maybe you're not familiar with this, but ice crystal formation is incredibly important for this freezing the semen. And I've been to this, these places where they do that, and they have like this system where they stepwise slow the temperature down from body temperature when they collect the semen and they slowly go down to uh, liquid nitrogen which is what minus 320 Fahrenheit I think and then here's the kicker when you thaw it it has to be thawed fast so you take it from liquid nitrogen and you put it in water that's body temperature and so the thawing is like this Fast, and that also pre helps prevent ice crystal formation. So it's really kind of weird. Stepwise, slow down, but fast up. And then the other thing is, once you get semen thawed at body temperature, it should be kept there until you put it in the cow. And that's where people falter. They'll thaw it, and then by the time they get to the cow, it might be going like this, and that's bad. It's thaw, and then keep it. Okay, now you, you were seven? Yes. Okay, number eight. Oh, that's right, eight's right here. Okay, let me see this for a second. Can I have two pictures? Did you? Let, yes. Let's see if we got it. Here? Yes. Here? Yes. Oh, excellent. And here's this. Let me make sure. Okay, I'll make it here. Okay, so I'm okay. just going to talk about how we keep the temperature rate regulated in piglets. So this is an actual picture of our setup at home. And as you can see, there's sows and barren crates, and then these are called heating lamps. And in every barren crate, um, where the sows and the piglets are, there'll be a heating lamp, and then there's a mat on the floor. Um, and that just helps keep the little pigs, like, warm. They're not very big, so it's really hard to keep their temperature regulated. They're supposed to be, like, around 100 and, I think, 1.6 to, like, 104 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So that's not a big, uh, very big range. So the mat at the bottom just helps like the air not cool them down anymore. And then the lamp, it's really important that it's not too far down because they can heat up a little too much. Um, and it has to be like far enough back from the mom's head. But that's how you keep them warm. And then this graph. This graph just shows um, when the baby pigs are like too cold, they'll like shiver and they'll be like really close on top of each other to try to keep warm. Um, and you can see 39 degrees Celsius, which is like 102 degrees Fahrenheit, I want to say, to like 43 degrees Celsius is like the range, so it's not very big, so it's really important um, to keep them in between there. But yeah, these heating lamps, and that's just how you keep them warm. Yeah, and there's your um, thermal neutral zone right there. Yeah, right here. Yeah. We'll talk more about that Monday. That's perfect. Questions, comments? 
because if you keep an animal in the thermal neutral zone, that's where they make the most money for you and the, they're most comfortable. Okay. Number ten. Last but not least, let me find it for you and make sure it's the right size. That's. I saw that picture come in and I had to laugh because that's what the pigs like to do, right mm -hmm. there. Are you going to use the W word? The what? The W word? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about pigs wallowing in the mud or in water. Um, and animals that wallow in the mud or water do this to keep their body cool on hot days. Um, it's their way of protecting their bodies from extreme temperatures. And some other animals that do that are pigs, buffaloes, and hippos. Um, in this case, I'm going to be talking about pigs specifically, um, but pigs have very few sweat glands and so wallowing in the mud is a way for them to regulate the temperature since they don't have that other way of like perspiration and sweating. Um, wallowing is the best way to regulate because as the cool, wa cool water evaporation through mud is slower, which allows the pig um, to reap the cooling benefits for longer. And wallowing can lower a pig's temperature by 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit which makes it more efficient than sweating or just like dumping cool water on them. Um, wallowing is also used for other reasons. Mud provides protection from insects, insect bites and also um, from other types of parasites because it acts as a suffocating barrier um, for living organisms to live. Um, wallowing is also used for pigs to mark their territory, which I found very interesting. I've never really heard that before, but I guess wild pigs, um, will like roll themselves in the mud and it'll be a way of them showing other wild pigs that that's their area. Another interesting thing that I found was that people are starting to consider the act of removing wallowing areas for pigs is an animal welfare issue. Um, and it's not because of the physical welfare, because if you're taking away wallowing areas and like putting them in a cooling unit barn, then that's not um, an animal welfare issue. But what it is, is it's more in a, a what do they call it, a mental wear fill of mental welfare because wallowing places are, um, it denies the pigs from their ability to make natural instincts and it's their natural instinct to wallow in the mud. Um, it's kind of like a, their fun spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean if you let, the best place that pigs want to be, they want to be outside in a pasture with some wallowing area, some grass because you know pigs are hindgut fermenters, do you guys know that? They, they can have a cecum that will take care of some roughage. Okay, excellent. Good, I have some time to do the thermal neutral zone. That's it, right, for everybody here? Brianna will do Monday. Okay, so let me do that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so it's TNZ, thermal neutral zone. And there'll be some nice little graphs. And great. Thermal neutral. There it is. And go here and <clears throat> okay. So here it is. I first of all notice there's no temperatures on this on the x-axis. It says temperature, but it doesn't have any temperatures because you can't put any temperature on there until you talk about a specific animal. Okay? So it would be different for blue, probably, I mean, very similar with grace, but pigs would be different, lactating dairy cows, dry dairy cows. What's a dry dairy cow? Not milky. So you got this thermal neutral zone. In humans, they call it the comfort zone, okay? And then on the left side, as temperature decreases, there's this point called the lower critical temperature. And then Monday, I'll bring some numbers. But for one thing, for right here, if this was a lactate dairy cow, I can speak louder than blue, so I'm not worried about it. Minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit right there. And that's absurd. Because a baby piglet is 88 degrees Fahrenheit. So there you got two numbers. The lower critical temperature for a baby pig is 88 degrees Fahrenheit. The lower critical temperature for a high producing dairy cow is minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The opposites, they're just so opposite. Okay, then on the upper end, it's called the upper critical temperature. That means anything past this, meaning 
warmer, then the animal has to do something to get rid of the heat because it's going to go. Well, here we are. We're doing thermal regulation three in our series, and I'm subtitling this the thermal neutral zone. This is a zone of, no, careful what I'm saying, a zone of the ambient temperature where basal metabolic rate is all that's needed to maintain body temperature. So it's also called environmental temperature, ambient temperature, wherever the animal or person is, that's their thermal neutral zone. And we're going to find out it's a zone of temperatures, or range, probably a better way of saying that, where the animal or person is most comfortable and is putting the minimum amount of metabolism to keep the body at the normal. I think in human engineering, they call it the comfort zone, but usually when you talk about animals, we talk about the thermal neutral zone. And uh, always looking for cute pictures, of course, and here's two buddies, and uh, they're probably in their thermal neutral zone. Now, I'm not sure if they'll get hot under that sheet that somebody put there, but uh, they look pretty comfortable. And good care of animals, when you care for your animals, you always try to have them in the thermal neutral zone. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some of this stuff in front of you. I'll pause and then things will appear magically, but of course, you know, you could pause it as well. And uh, what we've got here on the x-axis, well, first of all, I should say, I've got like two graphs on top of each other. Whenever you do this, the x-axis is the same. So this is ambient temperature down here. I don't have to label this again up here. It's ambient temperature, both x-axes. And then on the top, I'm going to monitor body temperature. And of course, you know, our animals are endotherms, homeotherms, they're going to maintain a constant body temperature over a certain range of environmental temperatures. But then I'm going to show you how things can go bad as well. And of course, we've heard of these stories where dogs or kids are locked in cars on a hot day and it's terrible. And of course, then those individuals suffer hyperthermia. I guess if it was winter and you're locked in a car, you would suffer hypothermia. We'll talk about it. The lower graph on the y-axis is metabolic rate. Okay, so that's metabolism. And I did say basal metabolic rate. I'm going to pause and draw a few more things and then come back. Okay, I've made some things appear, and I want to define them for you. And then I'll pause it again and build some more on this figure I'm making. Let's go over here to the far left where it says summit metabolism. I've drawn a line on the um, y-axis. That's the most heat that an animal can produce. Okay, And then down here, basal metabolic rate. That's the lowest amount of heat that an animal can produce. So you can see there's a range there. And of course, this is all talking about metabolic rate or metabolism. And then I've put in LCT and UCT down here on the x-axis, and they'll be spelled out perhaps in some other figures. They will. Uh, some I'll show you that other people have drawn, because the more you can look at these things, the better. But the LCT is an ambient temperature that any cooler than this, that means over here, then the animal has to produce more heat. And then the upper critical temperature, that's the hot end, let's put it that way, of the thermal neutral zone. And if you go hotter than that, that means the environment gets hotter than that, the animal has to expend more energy to try to cool off, like a dog panting, for example. Okay, now I've added data to the line. On the top, notice body temperature is in red. Okay, and here's our thermal neutral zone. Remember, body temperature will fluctuate a little bit. Of course, it's never going to be spot on like for a dog, 101.5. It's going to vary up and down a little bit, maybe by half a degrees. 
But what I want to show you then is that I've drawn two other lines here. This one here is like the point where if it gets any colder, then the animal will start dying. The tissue will freeze. So, you know, this was called lower critical temperature. Now I'm down on the bottom there, lower critical temperature. This one might be called the absolute lower critical temperature. And you'll see some graphs about this that are labeled absolute lower critical temperature. So in this range, body temperature stays normal because metabolism, heat production increases. Okay. And so then the body is able to adjust in this zone. It adjusts by increasing heat production. It can't go any more than summit. So if it gets colder than this point, tissue starts freezing and the animal will die sooner or later. See how temperature also goes down? Body temperature, that is, because we're on the cool end of the zone. And so you'll see other figures will say death by hypothermia, or at least you start having hypothermia, the dog. Now this, now I'm down on the bottom again, to the right of the UCT, the upper critical temperature, where my red pointer is, this might be called the absolute upper critical temperature. Well, if you go higher than that, the body temperature starts rising. So you would have hyperthermia, right? Now the interesting thing on the blue line here is it'd really be nice um, between in this zone to decrease heat production. But remember, you can't go below basal. So the dog pants, well, that makes muscles contract. And so you're going to make more heat, actually. But it's still going to have a normal body temperature because the panting is going to get rid of more heat than the muscles produce heat from panting. But after this line, then things go bad. It's just too hot for the body. So this is the upper, this is the absolute upper critical temperature down here. So hopefully you can follow those lines and then I will be showing you other figures like this because other people use different names and it's good to see a variety of things. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is show you some of these same drawings that I made, but other people have different labels, different ways. Notice how we never told you what the temperature actually is, that lower critical temperature or any of them down on the x-axis. And I'll explain that later, but it depends what animal you're talking about. So let me rapidly go through this. You can pause it, of course. There's a thermal neutral zone, lower critical temperature, upper critical temperature. They're calling it the upper lethal temperature. That's another name for this point where body temperature stays normal but then once you get hotter than that remember this is environmental and they're calling it ambient same difference then the body temperature goes up and you could die or you have hyperthermia the dog does and at the extreme you die of hyperthermia and remember then this is bad for tissue to get that hot so then tissue starts dying and if tissue starts dying then it's producing less heat because this think of this as heat production right on the left side remember we get colder, but we can adjust our heat production up to the summit and maintain body temperature. But if it gets colder than this point, which is the lower lethal temperature, they're calling it, then tissue starts freezing and then frozen tissue doesn't make any heat. Okay, let me show you another one. This might be talking about birds, but it's still the same principles, okay? So here we've got the thermal neutral zone right here, right? Between the lower critical temperature and the upper critical temperature. Then they've named the upper lethal temperature and the lower lethal temperature. Everything's good. Basal metabolic rate here, normal temperature. You get a little cooler, normal temperature. Why? The body makes more heat. But after this point, then we start getting too cold. We can't make more heat and things start freezing and become non-functional. Hypothermia. Okay, they call this normal thermia, I guess, over there. And then on the hot end, hyperthermia, of course, is when you get above the upper lethal temperature. This doesn't show the downward uh, point, but definitely you're going to have metabolic rate go up for a while, but then over 
time it's going to go down. They just don't show it. And then here's the body temperature. Now they make a good point. Evaporative cooling is very important on the hot end of the scale. Okay. On the other end of the scale, you're using metabolic heat that you're producing to be normal. Okay, I'm going to explain one more figure. I'm going to not enlarge it real large right now because I want us to read the print on the side, right? The thermal neutral zone, the zone of environmental temperatures, which uh, metabolic rate is at basal. Then they define basal metabolic rate. And then below and above the thermal neutral zone, an animal has to increase its metabolic rate, okay? So now, let me enlarge this thing here. Again, it's very similar to what we've done before. Body temperature, I think they're talking about humans here, but over a long range, we can maintain our body temperature. And then there's, again, they've got this zone, and they've, like me, showed after a certain point, metabolic activity goes down because tissue's dying. And then you have, you're able to make more and more heat up to a certain point, and then after that, you have your tissue start freezing, so your heat production goes down. And of course, you can read the bottom, but again, it's very similar. Everybody displays it a little differently, and it's good to see more than one type of graph. That way, you can say, Oh, I know how to explain this, whether I've ever seen it before or not. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about the lower critical temperature and maybe somewhat the upper critical temperature. Remember, those are the two things that are the side, the ends of the thermal neutral zone. So I know we don't usually talk about calves, but I want to show you this graph, figure, illustration, whatever you want to call it. And they've just, they're talking about lower critical temperature here, that thermal neutral zone, and then the upper critical temperature. They're not showing any other part than that. The one thing you should realize is there's a lot of variability in what's the lower critical temperature for even a certain species. It can change dramatically. And that's why I haven't really given you any of those figures yet. And a good figure, like I've shown you before, doesn't show any values down there because it depends on what animal, depends on if they're pregnant or not, if they're milking or not. Um, it, you know, how long their hair coat is and another thing that it depends on is acclimation if an animal acclimates to its environment over time it's going to change its lower critical temperature okay so that's one thing you should be aware of it's hard to put numbers here but now these people for calves they said that the lower critical temperature is like uh, 59 degrees if the animal is less than 21 days of age okay and then once they get old, older than 21 days, then it drops to 42. They're probably getting more body weight on them, I'm sure. And then the upper critical temperature happens to be 82. And they say beyond both of these ranges, you have to expend more energy. We already know that. So let me tell you some of the values for some animals, okay? Now I've got this data for Eskimo dog, and they're saying in the reference I was reading, this point here, lower critical temperature for an Eskimo dog. Now remember, they've always lived in cold for generations. This point is minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's kind of hard to believe, but that dog genetically is made for that snow, okay? Now I've got a figure for a horse. Uh, let's see, got to get my right thing to drag it. I'm, also, I'm always talking about the lower critical temperature now here. One reference I saw for a horse was five degrees F, but I also no, saw another one that it would be about 40 degrees F or very similar to the figure they have for the calf. It depends on the coat length, if they're acclimated to it, uh, it's amazing all the things that can go in here. So never be too concerned about having exact figures because for example, sheep, if they have a certain length of fleece, let's say two, three inches, and then you shear them, take the fleece off, that automatically makes their lower critical temperature higher. So like, let's see, let's say it's here, 
for a sheep that has like two inches of wool. If you shear it, it's going to be able to stand the cold less, and that means it's got a new lower critical temperature. So you can, in that example, you can change the lower critical temperature of an animal just by taking off its protection, its insulation. Okay, and metabolism is very important too. Uh, the more a dairy cow milks, the better she can stand cold because. She's a walking furnace when she's making, listen to this, 100 pounds of milk a day. Do you know that's, you know, a gallon is about 8 pounds. So what's that? 12 gallons of milk a day from one cow. Think of it. Go buy 12 gallons and say, one cow did this today. Well, that's a lot of metabolism. And I'll give you her number. It's way over here. A high-producing dairy cow. Remember the Eskimo dog was minus 22? The high producing dairy cow, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it's lower critical temperature. That means its thermal neutral zone <laughs> doesn't end until minus 40. Of course, here's another thing. The lower your lower critical temperature is, the lower your upper critical temperature is. It's going to shift that way as well. So that high producing dairy cow, it's going to get hot probably whenever it gets 70 or above, maybe even 65. Amazing stuff. And of course, we want to keep our pets, and in this case, dogs, comfortable when it gets hot. And I found this little public service uh, announcement, I guess. It's talking about heat stroke and hot asphalt. You know, asphalt is usually black, and we haven't said it yet. We will in an upcoming thermal uh, lesson. But black is a color that absorbs the most radiant heat from the sun. And here they're trying to say, I'm over here on the far left, uh, press the back of your hand firmly against the asphalt for seven seconds to verify that it's comfortable for your dog. Yeah. Anyway, they showed air temperature, right? That would be ambient temperature around the dog, or at least maybe up a little higher. They didn't say where they measured it. And then they measured the asphalt, right? And you can do that with one of those infrared thermometers. And look at the air temperature is 77, but you would assume this is going to be on a, um, I guess, they're, are they talking about, yeah, direct sun, no wind, very low humidity, yeah, and high radiant energy. So they're saying the sun's out in full blast. The air might be 77, but the asphalt's 125. That's going to be pretty hot. And it says down here at 125, skin destruction can occur in 60 seconds. But then when you get hotter, look at how it goes up, 143 degrees. And it's talking about how you can fry an egg at 131. And then when it's hot outside, the cars heat up very fast. And I would not doubt it can go fat higher than 120 degrees in that car. So it's amazing. Watch out for your pets. And the other thing they make a good point is, um, zero wind because remember wind depends on the temperature of the wind but a lot of times it has a cooling effect and when I talked about just previously all those thermal neutral zones and the lower critical temperature one assumption is that there's no wind because then wind adds what's called wind chill which we'll be talking about later and so it messes up that chart a little bit because when there's wind out there then an animal is going to lose heat faster on that lower end of the temperature range and finally here's a list of those great illustrations those thermal neutral zones and figures look more professional but than mine but i tried to build one at step at a time for you okay see you next time